Hey guys and gals, welcome back to DIY Guitar Making at Eric Schaefer Guitars. We're going to talk about what I did for day 7 of the Guitar 106 build for David in California. It's a commissioned build and uh, hopefully I'll have it done in time. <laughs> um, no, no, but seriously, I have a specific ship date, which um, I might have to, it's not a big deal, but I might have to move that a little bit because the spring workshops are coming up and I have to be ready for those as well. Spring workshops, by the way, are classes where students come in and we build a flat top acoustic guitar together here with me in the shop over the course of nine days. But let's get back to guitar 106. Uh, what did I do on day seven? So not a whole lot, which by the way, you guys might notice that some days I get sort of a bewildering array of tasks done within a single day. And then other days, eh, it's kind of underwhelming. I only do a couple things. Well, that's just the reality of running a business. Some days I'm just 100% there and in the flow of guitar building itself. And other days, you know, I'm on the phone for an hour doing this and that or, you know, having to do stuff on my computer, which is uh, not what I want to be doing. <laughs> I'd much rather be here in the shop uh, filming with you guys like this or even just building and uh, you know, with music on in the background. Love doing that. Anyway, I'm rambling here a little bit. Let's go and take a look at what I did, which was notching out the kerfing for the brace ends of the back, uh, marking those notches, putting a label on the back, and ultimately installing the back onto the rim set. All right, let's go take a look. All right, so here is the back all glued up to the rim set with, as you can see, just a cluster, almost use a bad word there, but a cluster of clamps holding it together. There's uh, a lot of ways, a lot of different ways to attach the back to the rim set and none are really necessarily better than others. They all kind of work. But you know what, we'll talk about that in a second. Let me kind of go over uh, step by step what I did yesterday. So I installed a label. These are my labels, which I print out on parchment paper. And actually I talked about this a lot in the last episode. So if you're interested in that, just check out that last episode. So I installed that label and then clamped the back to the rim set so that I can mark out the locations of the brace ends that get tucked or notched into the kerfing, okay? And in this case, that's eight different brace ends for this latticed braced back. Um, so I have a, a very different kind of bracing pattern here than your usual ladder bracing. So that puts those brace ends in different places and coming in sort of at oblique angles, kind of like the X-brace does. So uh, one little tip for marking out those notches, and this is actually something that I discovered recently. I used to clamp the back down and then just go around, take a pencil and make little marks where those brace ends stick out. But recently I realized that I can use this little pen knife attachment right here. So this is something that would be sold in the section of say a Michaels or an AC Moore. AC Moore's out of business, so scratch that. <laughs> sold in the section of a Michaels, they're still around, uh, where they would also keep the razor blades and things like that. So any hobby store should have something like this. You know what, I don't know what to call this. It's like a key, I would say this is a keyhole saw, but I'm gonna, uh, when I edit this video, I'll double check that and give you guys a little heads up on what this is so you can find it if you'd like. But basically this little saw here is skinny enough at the tip that when I clamp the back down for the purpose of marking out those notches, 
I can take this and just pull it, place it underneath the back and rest it right against the side of that brace and then just do a light filing on the kerfing and I get a perfect mark of where the edges of those braces are. Whereas when I do this with pencil, there's a little bit of, um, you're trusting your hand a little bit. There's some human error there. You might uh, make the line a little too fat or go off to the side a little bit more than you intended. It's a little harder to line it up by eye with a pencil. So for accuracy, try this out guys. A little keyhole saw, I'm calling it for now. And then I cut my notches. As I've talked about before, I have my two Dremel system. What I mean by that is I've got one Dremel with these plastic or acrylic really attachments that I've made. I, I customized this Dremel so that I can uh, use it to trim down the height of my brace ends very accurately. Okay, I've talked about that before. I'm not gonna talk about that too much. And then this is the companion Dremel to this one because this is set to the same height, but essentially it's an inverse cut to what this is doing. So that way I get a perfect fit between my brace ends every time. Repeatability, consistency is a good thing. And then I run glue around the, the rim and clamp this whole thing down. Now you can see I have this clamped up with a bazillion clamps in my uh, go bar deck, which is attached to my shop stand. This is a special setup that I modified my uh, radius dishes to be able to be installed onto my shop stand like this, which I do this for a number of reasons. Um, not the least of which is the fact that it makes brace carving a lot more comfortable because I can just sit right under this table and carve right into the dish like that. But you guys might not have, probably won't have a setup like this. Um, but So just keep in mind there's, a, like I said, a hundred different ways to clamp this down. You can do this in the GoBar deck. If you're already using a GoBar deck to install your braces, you might as well also use the GoBar deck to glue the plates on, okay? So there's just one other way of doing this. And uh, why don't we go ahead and take these clamps off just so we can see this. All right, and there it is. So I'm gonna keep the mold on here. That's important because the next thing I have to do is install the top on here and the mold and the spreaders really help the sides to maintain their form. In fact, I leave the spreaders in when I glue the top, which you might think, well, then you can't get your spreaders out. But actually, all of these spreaders, each one breaks down into three individual components. So this bar here, the turnbuckle, is not attached to these pads. So when I loosen this, I can actually pull the bar out through the sound hole, then this piece, and then this piece, and etc. for these other two. So yeah, you can see the bracing pattern now, and the label right there. Oh, by the way, I just want to mention, if you don't have, you know, a lot of people have spreaders that are just single units. It's not that big of a deal to just take your spreaders out now and then install the top without any spreaders pushing up against the sidewalls. Uh, but I do find my sides are a little bit, just a little bit more square by leaving the spreaders in. Okay, so it, it makes things, you know, just that extra one or two percent better. Okay, so there you have it. I've got some notches to cut for the soundboard side now, and I've got to glue that down and, uh, you know, just move on from there. All right, guys, that's all I got for you today. I'll see you in the next one. Bye for now.
If you learned something here, please give this video a like and subscribe so you can be notified when I release a new DIY guitar making video. And if you want to really learn more, take one of my structured online courses at ericschaferguitars.com or register for a hands-on guitar building workshop here with me in Burnville, Pennsylvania.